what does uh, Buddhism, what the Buddhism can say about astrology? Astrology plays a very important role in Tibetan medicine. Um, actually, the school where Tibetan medicine doctors are trained in Dharamsala, uh, the old name is TMAI, which stands for Tibetan uh, Medical and Astro, Astrology Institute. So the doctors uh, learn both Tibetan medicine and astrology. It's felt to be very, very important. Um, I don't know the very details of Tibetan astrology. I know some things about it, uh, but I couldn't give you a comparison between Hindu or other forms of astrology. But I do know that it's very much um, uh, considered to be important. Uh, many people, the TMAI publishes a little small calendar every year, and in there they have important and dangerous astrological uh, dates. You know, when it's good to make certain kinds of decisions, and other days, you know, not to make certain kinds of decisions, uh, to do special kind of rituals on certain days, to make important decisions, uh, which could be in business, could be in life, could be in family life, you know, on certain days and others not. So astrology does play a very important role. Yes. Uh, thank you. Please, the next question. Question. It was just so uh, interested, uh, interesting for me. I saw that line, you know, of EEG, and uh, just a remark for you as a doctor. It looked, uh, well, it looked so similar to the line on EEG of uh, a fit of absence epilepsy. Yes. Do you know? And it is also a changed state of mind. Do you think these things are in in any way connected? You know? And yeah, yeah. Interesting question. Very interesting question. Thank you. You mean absence seizures? Yes, well, like uh, sm there are uh, big fits and small fits, mm -hmm. absences. Temporal lobe? Yes. Temporal lobe, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, my second, well, it is a question already. Um, according to the philosophy of Buddhism, as far as I know, as, as, as far as I understand it, uh, any feeling, any, every, all the feelings, passion, love, etc., they are all... Uh, just different kinds of uh, of suffering. So the right uh, state of mind, according to Buddhism, is like like feeling nothing, just like being calm. And you know, I just incapable of an understanding it as a European. Good, thank you. Um, the first comment, uh, very interesting kind of observation about these uh, gamma waves, and could they be? have anything to do with absence or temporal lobe, so-called small seizures. Um, I don't think so, because in those kind of seizures, people usually don't have memory afterwards. And meditators have very acute uh, memory of the experience of their meditations. Uh, secondly, these happen not just in the temporal areas. You don't see these findings just over the temporal lobes. You find them everywhere over the whole cortex. Mm -hmm. um, and thirdly, you find them in all these long-term meditators. So it would be unusual to pick 11 people, yeah. you know, and have them all have absence or temporal lobe seizures. That'd be very highly unusual. So it's an interesting observation. Uh, I don't think there's a relationship. One last point on that, on that comment. Recently, there was some work published on mi mice, uh, or rats or mice who unfortunately in the lab they were sacrificed, they were killed. And at the time of their death, they displayed gamma waves. Oh, they the, were checking, the wave of death, so-called. Uh, no. I think they may have called this that. These, these bursts of gamma waves that I showed here. Um, so could there be something about the death experience, which in, in Buddhism is actually an eight-stage process. It's much uh, more prolonged than clinical medical, modern medical death. Um, uh, so could there be some association with that near-death experience? We don't know, but that was some interesting research. Your second question, um, does the Dalai Lama look somebody, like somebody who's very boring and dull? 
He's very active. He has an incredible sense of humor. He's very dynamic. He speaks out again and again about injustice. So sometimes, you know, many of us have this kind of common misperception that kindness, love, compassion, you know, patience means that you're totally passive. You know, you're like this wet vegetable. You don't have any guts. You're not strong. You have no courage. Actually, I think it's the opposite. If you take people like Mother Teresa, she was this about five foot, you know, woman, Albanian woman, incredibly powerful. And she was motivated all the time by love and compassion. So this is the strength and the power of love and compassion. Mahatma Gandhi was the same way. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the same way. So, you know, it's a real active state. It brings incredible strength, courage, and clarity in our minds and hearts when we practice this compassion and love. So this is maybe a, maybe, you know, our English terms are not so good for these states. Um, but uh, these are actually very active, wonderful states, uh, wonderful ways to live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Yes, please. Спасибо. Скажите, Барри, почему... Could you please... Why, uh, why of all the um, reformation uh, of all the uh, contemporaries of uh, Paracels, you just uh, um, you just picked uh, Paracelsus? Is he closer to Buddhism? Because uh, there were others like Jan Gus and Calvin and uh, many other leaders. Why did you choose uh, Mar Martin Luther to uh, just compare to Paracelsus? Because uh, she is a Lutheran, actually. You see? <laughs> Your question. You know, I'm not an expert on Paracelsus. Um, in fact, I had to read about him because this lecture coincides with his death anniversary. So they wanted to link. And he was, as Albina mentioned, uh, the first, recognized as one of the first to huh? make this connection between emotions and physical illness or physical okay. well being. Um, so, um, I think that's why, because of the date, I think that's why he was chosen. And this psychological, he's known to, ha you know, to understand emotions is very, very important in, in, il in, the, in physical illness. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly other people could have been chosen. As far as I know, he wasn't Buddhist. As far as I know, and again, I'm no expert, uh, he didn't really have access to Buddhist texts, as far as I know. But I may be wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Do you practice yoga? And uh, uh, which diseases can cure or prevent yoga? Thank you. Can be cured or prevented by practicing yoga? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I practice yoga. Um, I don't know. You know, the, the breathing part of yoga, the pranayam, uh, I think is very powerful in uh, balancing a lot of these emotions and kind of pre or early physical illness. And so I think that probably some diseases can be at least modified and possibly cured. Uh, particularly respiratory kind of diseases. Maybe we would probably say non-infectious kind of respiratory diseases. Um, um, I think that blood pressure problems, high blood pressure, can be reduced through yoga. Uh, whether it happens every time or not, I don't know. But I think it has that potential. Um, other illnesses, um, maybe some different psychological illnesses might be reduced through the practice of yoga. There are many traditions of yoga, many ways that it's practiced. Um, but I think that it does, can play an important role in good physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Thank you. Uh, what do you think? 
maybe you have some uh, scientific data. The skills uh, of uh, the people practicing meditation, which you talked about, uh, is it pr possible to achieve only through uh, long practice, or can it be achieved like spontaneously? And uh, the second question, uh, is it possible to develop such uh, skills uh, or trainings uh, in young children? What do you think about it? Marvelous question. Are you a scientist? Yes. No. <laughs> because this is the question that many brain scientists have been asking since this research that I presented about six years ago. And now there are many programs studying meditation and positive mental states of mind, states of heart, like love and compassion, <coughs> forgiveness, generosity, honesty, and seeing if uh, we can use those in a short period of time Often they're looking just for two weeks and see if that makes a difference in the person. Uh, as Albina mentioned, I'm a consultant for the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and particularly the one in Leipzig. And there we have a training, compassion, uh, long-term research project. And we're also going to be looking at very short intervals of training, compassion, because that's what's practical. Obviously, most people can't spend years and years in meditation. And the preliminary data coming out of Princeton, University of Wisconsin, uh, and uh, from the Max Planck Institute, the preliminary data is that yes, even short periods of training in compassion make a difference, a positive difference. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, I don't know much about Buddhism. It's limited to Wikipedi Wikipedia. Probably my, uh, I can sound naive. Uh, now uh, I have a sore, sore throat. Uh, did you have a sore throat? And what would you recommend uh, to people who are just sick? And the second question, uh, uh, do you believe uh, in uh, wave genetics? Uh, the term wave genetics. <laughs> She's just shy. The, the person is just shy, and uh, we we thought that probably we should uh, have written questions for these persons. So please, uh, uh, the first question. Uh, uh, so the first question is: uh, When you are just sick, when you are when you get cold, uh, did you have this? And what would you recommend to the Moscovites? I'll go see the doctor. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is too simple. <laughs> oh, okay. It's on the severity of the illness. Um, but uh, one of the things that's a very good kind of, we say, adjunct, it's kind of a, um, a separate but important practice when we get sick, is love and compassion. Is to remember all the other Moscovites, or maybe even Russians or humans, yeah, that have the same sore throat. <laughs> and wish that your sore, sore throat could take on all of their sore throats so they could be better like that. Yeah? And my sore throat will get better. I'll do what I need to do. I'll gargle with salt water, take vitamin C, these kind of things. Um, and I will get better. In the same time, my imagination is that I'm taking away this uh, illness from everyone. So this often, you know, sometimes when we have when we're sick, I mean, maybe a small th sore throat is not the best example, but sometimes when we're sick, we begin to sort of, you know, think, uh, you know, oh, why did it happen to me? And, you know, I'm not ready to be sick. And, you know, I'm not feeling well. I want to go back to bed. And, you know, um, <clears throat> but if we can kind of uh, invigorate ourselves, invigorate ourselves, inspire ourselves, uh, one of the best methods is to have concern for others, to think about others, and to w even just on a wishing level, 
to wish them to be well. Yeah? Uh, this is very, very powerful practice. And in fact, uh, many people uh, ask His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, how do I prepare for my death? And they're waiting for some kind of, you know, mystical or something, you know, answer. And he says, love and compassion. Practice kindness, warm heart. This is so, so important. Um, so I would just give the same advice as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Yes. Thank you. Okay, can you again? Uh, Thank you very much. When uh, were you sick last time? Sick right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have some problem in my lung. Actually, today I had some fluid drawn off my lung just a few hours ago. <laughs> but uh, uh, I didn't want to cancel this program because I wanted to be with all of you and Albina and her crew. Everyone has done such an amazing job to organize this. It's taken a lot of time and effort and work, so we didn't want to have it canceled. And, uh, you know, I try to also think about others and have a warm heart. And then this little thing here is nothing yet. <laughs> We are very happy to have you here at Rio Novosti. Thank you very much uh, that you came here. My question is uh, related to your previous answer. So we talk about here about uh, the link between emotions and uh, illnesses, but uh, many Buddhist practitioners, they, they have diseases, even in the Buddhist monasteries. Could you please say uh, about the, what causes the illnesses according to the Buddhist teaching? Good, thank you. That's a deeper question. <laughs> um, karma. Karma. And karma means action. And actually, if we look closer, what it means is are the consequences of an action. So, for example, let's say we do a simple thing like take a you know, glass of water, a sip of water. Um, <clears throat> once you've finished drinking, that action's finished. But there's still something left over, which is karma, that will ripen later and will determine you know, illness or well-being or happiness or suffering. Now, drinking a glass of water is generally neutral, so it won't have much impact. But... If I drank that glass of water thinking that I was quenching the thirst of everyone that's thirsty, people, animals, everyone, yeah? Then that would be a very positive action. And when I finished drinking that glass of water with that motivation, later on, maybe this life, maybe later, who knows, uh, something positive would come back as a result of that. And vice versa. If I were to uh, steal something from someone, or a better example is if I were to harm somebody physically and beat them over the head, okay? Um, the result of that karma, then the beating is finished. I, I don't beat people over the head. I, please don't misunderstand it. <laughs> but just an example, somebody beats somebody over the head. And then later in that person's life, or maybe even in future, um, uh, that karma would ripen in some kind of physical problem. Might be illness, disease, uh, might be even shortened life. Um, so even Buddhist monks who are practicing, you know, being very good people, we all have stores of karma from earlier in this lifetime and, and also from previous lifetimes. So it's kind of the ripening of that karma that may have been accumulated from a long time ago. Спасибо вам большое. Я немножко схитрила. Я просто хотела, чтобы вы немножко рассказали о карме. Uh, so this, is, uh, this was actually my trick. I wanted you to talk about karma a little bit. Because I know about karma. I just wanted the others to hear about it. Because this is very, very important. I'm translating a book about karma. And we're talking about diseases. So we need to know the, what causes the diseases. And we know that uh, our harmful actions will uh, result in uh, bad uh, consequences. Thank you very much. Writing a book on karma. <laughs> Um, I, I'd like to add one last point. If I could put this in a lar larger schema, that is the question of karma and uh, later um, consequences, 
If we put that in a larger schema, we would look at it like this. Um, uh, it starts with an ignorance, an ignorance in terms of reality. And basically that means we don't deeply know who we really are. What we think is ourself is mistaken, and we act on that and get into a lot of trouble. Okay, So that's the ignorance. And then because of that ignorance, we um, are kind of deluded yeah, uh, into uh, practicing these what we call destructive emotions. We get angry. Okay? We become jealous. Sometimes we're arrogant. Sometimes we're really hard on ourselves, angry and putting ourselves down. Uh, you know, these things result from that ignorance. Okay? Then, th that's the second step then. Ignorance and then destructive emotions. And then the destructive emotions propel us to act. Body, speech, and mind. So physical action, whatever it is. Speech, you know, what we say. And then our mind. What we think, what we feel, you know, all the things in our mind and heart. Um, and then the result of all of that is difficulties. Yeah? Uh, now, when we can begin to understand this wisdom, uh, the wisdom is in 100% opposite to this ignorance. So when we start, it's like a balance or a teeter-totter, you know, a balance. When we start to understand the wisdom, automatically... The, the, the ignorance comes down. And the more our, our wisdom is, is understood and, and realized, then the, w the ignorance goes way down. And eventually, the ignorance is done. And it's all wisdom. At that stage, then we no longer, then this whole kind of system stops. Okay? We no longer act, we no longer have these destructive emotions. So no more anger, no more jealousy, no more pride, all that stops. And therefore, we don't act on those destructive emotions. You know, we don't go around saying bad words or fighting or, you know, stealing and doing all these harmful things. We don't do that anymore. It's zero. So we don't make any more karma. And at that stage, uh, you know, it leads to much higher or deeper realizations. Eventually, Buddhahood, which is said to be where we no longer take rebirths. So we, we have a deathless state. Uh, so that's kind of the larger schema, which was stimulated by your comments and question. Thank you for tricking me into talking oh about karma. <laughs> uh, the prostration practice, how does it uh, uh, affect the physical health? Does it affect the physical health and how? And how do the prostrations uh, affect uh, your state of mind, your mind? I think they do. I think they do. Prostrations does um, have an effect on your health, a positive effect on your physical health. Um, when I do my prostrations in the morning, uh, I feel much better. <laughs> My body feels better, my heart, my mind feels much better. Um, uh, you know, it depends also on the motivation that we have while we're doing our prostration. Uh, many of you don't know what a prostration is. Uh, how many are unfamiliar? You don't know what a prostration is? Raise your hands. Most of you. Okay, good, good, good. So a prostration is a form of a, it's a physical behavior that is showing respect. Respect to whom or to what? It's respect to the Buddha. And not really to a person. It's really to the teachings of the Buddha. Because these teachings of compassion and wisdom lead us to deeper and deeper states of happiness, joy, love, and compassion. Uh, so that's kind of... And one kind of goes down. A small prostration is when one goes down on the knees, touches the knees and the hands and the forehead to the ground. Usually in front of a a venerable object, like some of the texts, which are the teachings of the Buddha, or the commentaries, or a statue of the Buddha. Um, and the full prostration, you go all the way, you know, spread out on your tummy, arms, you know, in front of you, and come back up. Um, it's a wonderful form of physical exercise. I think it does keep us healthy in terms of physical health, and it has a wonderful effect on the emotional health, 
Uh, so people that have depression, I won't ask you, but I'm sure that almost all of you suffer sometimes from depression. I know that. Um, <clears throat> even uh, you know, having depression or sadness or fear or anxiety can be helped by doing, uh, by doing prostrations. Exactly how it works, I'm not sure, um, but I think it does work for many people. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Спасибо. Пожалуйста. Headphones. Wouldn't get it. So, um, you mentioned eight stages of death. Could you please tell a little bit more about these stages? Do they correspond to the to four perinatal matrices of Stanislas Grove, something like this? Does it ring the bell? There are eight stages in the process of death according to the Buddhists. Um, <clears throat> Stanislav Grof, some of his, his psychology and philosophy is very close to Buddhist. Uh, I don't know if he actually was a Buddhist. I don't think so, but a lot of his work is very similar. It resonates with Buddhist thought. Um, so, but I don't know these four stages you're mentioning, so I can't comment directly on that. But I can tell you a few things about the eight stages. Uh, the last few days in Moscow, we've been teaching this at the Avatar, um, it's called the Avatar, it's a, it's a, what is it, it's a hall, yeah. It's a beautiful building actually, they have wonderful activities, and so we've been giving, having our programs there. Um, and uh, the eight stages are, the first four are having to do with the body, and then the next four with the mind, or you could say soul, okay? Um, and the first four stages have to do with the different aspects kind of related to thermodynamics. Uh, weaken. So for example, the first is when the solidity element in the body, so the bones and the muscles and the hard stuff, yeah? It loses.